Oh, brothers and sisters, happy Sunday. Kim folk, let us pray. Almighty God, in this season of Lent, have mercy on our Jerusalem. Out of the abundance of your love, bring forth a word that saves. Amen. Jesus was unpopular amongst the political and religious elites in Jerusalem for a number of reasons. He sat down and he ate supper with the folks who were considered unclean, prostitutes, sinners, and outcasts. He shared his wine with many people. He drank alcohol. In one notable occasion, he even gave wine to a group of people who were already drunk. And he had, had a, he swore like a sailor. He just he couldn't keep a civil tongue in his head to save his life. The gospel authors have gleefully preserved several of his saltiest insults. And today he uses a word that in the culture of his age, well, could get your mouth washed out with dish soap. He, uh, he refers to Herod uh, as a fox. In the Greek Alopex. It's a dirty word. It's a cuss word. It's a cuss word in the Middle East to call anybody a dog. dog in that part of the world, dog is pretty much the, 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 the worst F word in the language. Uh, you call somebody a dog, you, they're going to provoke a fist fight. If you're familiar with Middle Eastern culture, you know about this. Dogs are not good animals in the Middle East. They're unclean and they're dangerous. Middle Eastern folks today look at dogs, I think the way that some Michiganders probably look at a, maybe a raccoon. Incidentally, this is why um, some of us were so deeply and profoundly disturbed when the photos of the horrors at Abu Ghraib uh, came out. Um, those of us who've lived in the Middle East because they were using dogs to torture those Iraqi prisoners. Now, dogs today in the Middle East and dogs also in Jesus' day were considered unclean and dangerous. To call somebody a dog was to provoke an immediate response. Now, the same is true to a lesser degree in our Western culture. However, under our special brand of patriarchy, we've changed the insult to use it pretty much exclusively against women, uh, only comparing someone to a dog when it's a woman, and then we compare her to a female dog. So we are not without this particular insult. But Jesus goes even one further today. He, Herod, isn't, Herod isn't even a dog. He's Alopex. He's a fox. A fox is like a dog, but worse. They're smaller and they're dirtier and they're sneaking around in the wilderness until they come in and steal your food. It's a thieving kind of dog that lives in a hole in the ground. A nasty name for a nasty man. I have to take note that Jesus' mother is not present when he uses this nasty word. I think he doesn't want to get in trouble. This isn't the only time Jesus uses cuss words, uh, but it is my favorite. And I know you're going to want to know, what other cuss words did Jesus use? And I'll say, see me after class. Cussing, cuss words, this thing, we get this confused with cursing or curse words. Curse words. We think about cursing in, usually in terms of the third uh, commandment, right? No taking the Lord's name in vain. So many of us raised to believe that that means mm, uttering a certain imprecative uh, involving God's name. It's not really the meaning behind that commandment. The first three commandments are really just the same commandment written different ways. Thou shalt have no other gods aside from me. Um, you shouldn't, you're not going to make a little god out of uh, clay or gold or something. Uh, and you're not going to use my name as God in vain ways, in ways that uh, point back at yourself. Uh, don't use my name to give yourself power and authority over other people. Those are all three different ways of just worshiping somebody other than God. Um, some also believe that the fourth commandment should be with the other three. Honor the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Uh, people who don't honor the Sabbath usually are worshiping something other than God. Oftentimes they're worshiping work or something like that. But anyway, 
Cursing versus cussing. Jesus cusses today when he calls Herod a fox, but he also curses. He curses Jerusalem. He says to Jerusalem, I leave you to your own house. Now, I've lived in a lot of different Jerusalems. I've been to Jerusalem. I didn't live there, the real Jerusalem, but I've lived in the following cities. And I think when I say lived in, I mean I was there long enough to be able to recommend a good steakhouse. Um, Kalamazoo, Grand Rapids, Chicago, Memphis, Nashville, and I'll add Mexico City because I I lived and worked there. But the the biggest city was Mexico City, Um, but I lived in Chicago was big. Memphis is big. People don't realize that there's a million people living in Memphis, Tennessee. I grew up in the country, though, in the woods. God put me to work in cities. I don't know why. I look forward to finding out someday. I prefer places where the birds are colorful and the squirrels are lean. Now, when I lived in Kalamazoo, I had a neighbor of mine. He was an interesting guy. He was a retired professor from Western Michigan University. And every spring, he'd knock on my door. And uh, if you open the door, he would invite himself right on in. And then he'd set about explaining how we were going to be doing cleanup projects around the neighborhood we lived in and painting some of the houses on our block and planting some gardens. This fella knew his Jerusalem. He knew his Jerusalem. It was his neighborhood. I want to believe that when Jesus Christ visits our city, Grand Rapids, or this neighborhood, as he surely does with some regularity, that he sees a city that is gathered in uh, a community, gathered in like a brood of chicks under the wing of a mother hen. Can we be a city that defies his curse? Well, I think the only thing that prevents that is the courage to try. Mediocrity is a great evil that crushes community. Any city in America could probably eliminate homelessness if they wanted to. It's been done in other places. Homelessness, the crime of residents and civilians being underhoused, is a man-made crisis. There are now, in the United States of America generally, um, and, and, and this is true, the latest census data, there are 14 empty residential units for every single homeless person that sleeps on the streets, every single man, woman, and child. Not every homeless family, every homeless individual. In Kent County, that number is a little bit lower. There's 11 empty residential units. Well, it would require the courage to act, to make of our Jerusalem into a place where all of the children are gathered in like chicks under the wings of a mother hen. Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Jesus says, how I've desired to gather your children together. and You were not willing. See, your house is left to you. Your house is left to you. What are the stones today that we throw at the prophets of God who level such curses at our communities, our Jerusalems? The stones, we throw at them, phrases like, it's too expensive, or it's not my job, or it's too much work, or those kids aren't my kids, and this isn't my house. Oh. Jesus says to Jerusalem, this is your house. A while ago, I heard a sheriff, uh, it was actually Sheriff uh, Rich Fuller uh, down in Kalamazoo. This was a long time ago. He's been sheriff for a long time. He said something that was about one of the smartest things I had ever heard. He was talking to a group of preachers, and he said to them, you either pay for schools or you pay for jails. Pick one or the other. I thought that was pretty smart. Now, that was kind of ironic at the time because back in that day, Lansing and Washington, D.C. were conspiring together to prevent us from paying for schools, and so Sheriff Fuller was out there shaking the bushes to pay for a new jail. But it doesn't change the fundamental truth of what he said. In your house, you're going to pay for schools, you're going to pay for jails. This is our house. Grand Rapids is our house. It has been left to us. This is our Jerusalem. The city isn't like Memphis. It isn't like Chicago. This isn't some sprawling metropolis where the levers of power are out of reach. I'm pretty sure you call the mayor and get a phone call back in about a week. Um, We are literally, all of us, in charge of how things go in our Jerusalem. The peace of our community is left up to us. All right, I'm going to give you a challenge and then a comfort, and then I promise I'll go sit down. First, the challenge. I was given 
an occasion once to speak to a church that was in imminent danger of closing. I've spoken to many such churches uh, in my capacity as a healer and church fixer and a consultant. And this church was in imminent danger of closing. I knew how much money they had left and I knew how much money they needed and I knew how much their building cost to operate and all these figures and facts added up to about a 12-month uh, timer on their budget. They were out of money, and out of members, and out of ideas. But they did have a really big, beautiful old building. One of the oldest and most beautiful buildings in town. And I think it was a bizarre experience because after I started speaking to them, I, all of them appeared to be operating under the assumption that nothing bad would ever actually happen. It was as though they thought, well, if things get bad enough, somebody uh, in a position of authority and power, maybe somebody from the city will show up and they're just going to take care of the things. They're going to take care of the building. Uh, or to, to put it a little bit less gracefully, uh, if things get bad enough around here, at some point mom and dad are going to step in and fix things. And it fell to me to be the one to say to them that this is their Jerusalem and their house is left to them. In fact, the only people who are going to do anything to fix the problem were the people in that room right then and there. In other words, there are no grown-ups on their way with easy solutions. The city isn't going to fix anything. You know, there's really no entity called the city. It's just us. We're the city. We are the Jerusalem. Our house is left to us. Jerusalem, your house has been left to you. Okay, that's the challenge. But now the comfort. If you and I bear even a passing resemblance in the shape of our hearts, our hearts are aching because of the condition of the world, especially these past two weeks. Things have spiraled out of center, out of control. This is my comfort to you in this season of Lent. The world is not your Jerusalem. Your community is. And so my comfort to you is to turn off the TV and stop doom scrolling on your phone. Tune down that noise and look out the window. Flowers are about to start popping. Look out the window at your Jerusalem, your Jerusalem. It's not over there. It's right here. Don't let your heart be troubled by the horrors that are always slouching toward the halls of power in this world. But rather, this week, focus on your Jerusalem. Focus on your Jerusalem. God has planted you in this city, in this community, in this place. And if you would pay a little bit less attention to national and international politics and more attention to your hometown community, you will see victory after victory after victory. Grand Rapids, maybe, or wherever you are, whatever town you're in, whatever city you're in. Take comfort in the knowledge that God has given you everything that you need to serve, heal, fix your Jerusalem, the city that has been left to you. Peace in our city begins with us. Us. And this is our Jerusalem, the place of Otawa, freezing ground. Joyful songs and beloved church. Here's our Jerusalem. So let's make peace here where God Almighty has sown our souls let all God's children in this beautiful, beautiful place covered with rapids so grand say, Amen.